podcast listeners, welcome to the NK News Podcast. This is your host, Jacko Zwetslut, and the day of recording today, it is Wednesday, April 26, 2023, and I'm happy to be joined in the NK News studio by Professor Andre Lankoff to talk about how dangerous things are on the Korean Peninsula right now. Uh, but please, first, a reminder and a request to leave a review about this podcast on whatever platform you use and to share this episode with everyone who you think should hear it or who might be interested. And what's more, like and subscribe to the whole series. Second, check out nknews.org, where each day my journalistic colleagues write the best North Korea-focused journalism. A subscription for a year costs less than a dollar a day, and you can also read Andre Lankov's regular columns at uh, nknews.org, only published there exclusively. So go and check that out. Uh, a subscription, of course, helps to fund not only the work that my journalists do every day, but also Andre's column and this very podcast that you're listening to right now. Thirdly, follow NK News Org on Twitter and me at Jack OZ. Are you on Twitter, Andre? No, not really. It's probably for the best. Uh, now, to introduce my guest today more fully, Professor Andre Lankov is a director of NK News and he writes a regular column exclusively for NK News, which is, as he is, one of the world's leading authorities on North Korea. He's a graduate of Leningrad State University, now probably has another name, St. Petersburg University. Yep. Uh, and he attended Pyongyang's Kim Il-sung University in 1984 and 85. He also teaches at Gungmin University here in Seoul. Welcome back on the show, Andre. It's been much too long between your last visit and this one. What's been keeping you so busy? Well, uh, North Korea, of course. It has been keeping me. It has been keeping me busy for roughly 40 years. Yeah, and in fact, that you've preempted my next question. You've been studying North Korea for roughly 40 years. You've seen a lot of events. You've seen three leaders come and two go. Uh, does anything feel fundamentally different about North Korea today compared to when you began studying it 40 years ago, or is it pretty much all the same? Uh, yes and no. Domestically, the country has changed dramatically and out of recognition. Uh, North Korea of 2023 is very different from North Korea of, say, 90 or maybe 1999. Mm -hmm. And North Korea, society? society and economy, everything, everything. domestically, yes. And uh, it's also very different. Uh, North, North Korea of 1999 is yep. very different from North Korea of, say, 1984, when mm. I first, first saw it. It has been two ages in North Korean history. Yep. Since then, uh, we can roughly associate it with... Um, Leaders, but it's not quite correct. I uh, saw so the final years of Kim Il Sung North Korea, which was a hyper Stalinist state with a total government control. Then we have chaos and growth of the market economy under Kim Jong Il, and then we had a modest uh, economic growth, which is now stagnation under Kim Jong Il. But if you talk about the foreign policy, yeah. it's the same old cycle. What was surprising? Well. Uh, when I was beginning to do North Korea, it was exactly the time when people began to suspect that North Koreans are developing their own nuclear weapons. Ah. But, uh, well, and it was sort of understood. They suspected this as early as 84? Yeah, 86, 87, okay. I would say. The first time I began to hear this talk was probably 86, 87. Yeah. Uh, definitely 88. But it was still few people would predict that they would get that far. Personally, I was always an optimist slash pessimist, yeah. always believed that they would have a functional nuclear weapons. Mm. But their current ability to develop ICBMs, yeah. including solid fuel ICBMs, yeah. capable of hitting the continental United States, is something not many people expected, say, just 10 years ago. But uh, foreign, nonetheless, in spite of these changes, the big domestic changes, and surprising success in the nuclear and missile program, otherwise, it's still the same cycle. It's still the same cycle. Over the yeah. last 35 years, not 40, maybe 35, the outside world oscillated between kind of soft approach mm -hmm. and hard approach, between hoax and doves. Neither approach has worked, and I strongly suspect they'll never really work, because both sides wanted to stop, freeze a nuclear program or get rid of North Korean nuclear program, and it's a question which has no solution, and you, you simply cannot get, you cannot get it. 
When you say that, that North Korea has had the same foreign policy for you know, as long as you've been studying it, does that include also policy regarding South Korea, which of course is not seen as a foreign country by North Korea? Uh, it's just formality. Of course it's a foreign country, okay. which, should be a, which, which is also a target ideal of a conquest. It's an area which should be really conquered sooner or later. Or liberated. Uh, well. Liberated from depends. American yoke um, of oppression, right? Uh, I don't think that in the depths of their heart the decision makers really see it that way. They used to see it that they way decades see. ago. Uh. Now it's just a territory which should be recovered, and uh, I don't think they care much what people are living on that territory are thinking about. Well, that leads me to your uh, most recent column for NK News entitled North Korea takes a step closer to dream of conquering South with solid fuel ICBM, which was published on NK News on April 20th. I encourage all listeners to read it. Now, in that column, well, first of all, let me start off with, with the headline. Uh, do you believe that North Korea actually wants to conquer South Korea in this lifetime? Or is it something very distantly aspirational? Well, it's a long dream. It's a long cherished dream. Whether it will ever become a reality or a practical policy, practical kind of t- political target, well, I don't know, nobody knows. North Korean government has always wanted to reestablish control over the entire Korean peninsula. Right. There were periods when such dreams looked completely unrealistic. Mm. Say, roughly for 20, maybe 25 years, between 1990, say, to 1993 and say maybe 2015 or so, it looked completely unrealistic. And, but it still remains a dream, the great dream for the future, yeah. when the glorious North Korean tanks will drive in not only Seoul, but Busan, Busan as well. Yeah. Okay, so in that column that we're uh, talking about, you point out that North Korea recently launched a Hwasong-18 ICBM, the, the newest kind yeah. of, uh, of missile, and that this year they have launched uh, 26 other projectiles, and last year almost 100. Are we living in dangerous times on the Korean Peninsula? Uh, yes and no. Uh, right now and in near future, by near future I, means, I mean maybe five years or maybe 10 years, I would not expect a serious confrontation here. Mm-hmm. But we are probably going to a relatively minor clash. By minor clash, I mean exchange of fire, these dozens, dozens of people, maybe even low hundreds, more or less than likely dozens of people killed, and media across the world running headlines about the war just to erupt in Korea, as they do every few years. It will be a false alarm, uh, but it, a lot, some people are probably going to die as a result of such confrontation. These, these people who will die, are, you, are we talking just military or are we talking military and civilians? It depends. Uh, both sides will probably target largely military t- kind of installations, uh, but uh, collateral damage is, seems to be almost unavoidable in the case of a large confrontation. Well, what do you base that uh, prediction on? Uh, because both sides want to show, each side, our side wants to show how tough it is. Uh, because the, uh, we, we have seen this pattern since the um, election of President Yoon, Yoon so yep. He wants to show to the North Koreans that he is tough. That for every North Korean action, provocative action, he will retaliate manifold. He also needs... He has said that, yeah. Yeah, and he needs to improve, uh, to strengthen the alliance with the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have this large number of large-scale military maneuvers. And what is interesting, there are many types of joint military exercises which have been conducted pretty much every year for decades and never much reported in the media. But now the... UN administration, they basically make sure that newspaper will learn about every single exercise, even if it's a relatively small scale, yeah, yeah. and it would be on the front pages. Of course, it's a message to Pyongyang, look how tough they are. Because, this, because un- until North Korea gets a, a spy satellite in orbit looking down on South Korea, its main source of information about these joint exercises is, is media reporting, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yes, it's exactly what I was told many times. And I believe that this is exactly the logic of the government. 
they don't trust their enemies' intelligence service. Uh-huh. They don't consider their enemies' intelligence service efficient enough. Right. So they are feeding intelligence to the enemy to terrify it. In the media, right. Yes. And uh, on the other side, uh, North Koreans are demonstrating the significant achievements of their military engineers. They are showing their new technologies. Some of the these technologies are impressive indeed. And for every attempt of South Korea to show its toughness through maneuvers, yeah. they reply with launching more and more missiles. Sometimes these missiles are quite well well tested, well known, but sometimes it's a new technology. Right. Uh, so, and they are almost definitely going towards the next nuclear test. So both sides want to show how tough they are. And there is a risk that sooner or later it will lead to escalation, that uh, North Koreans, probably it will be initiated by the North Koreans. I'm not sure, because uh, when you have such a tense situation, each side can deliberately or by mistake mm-hmm. do something which will trigger a confrontation. Uh, but most likely still that North Koreans will decide to send a signal to Seoul and they will stage some kind of armed provocation for which uh, South Koreans will retaliate on a really large scale. Okay, but but let's bring in the alliance here, because as you mentioned there, uh, President Yoon sung yeol wants to uh, to strengthen and, and, and uh, the uh, U.S. alliance and bring it back to the fore in, in uh, South Korea. Is the U.S. interested in an escalation? Nobody is interested in escalation. Uh, but, uh, okay, but is the U.S. interested in, in, in South Korea retaliating, you know, multiple times... I don't think so. I believe that the U.S. interest is to keep situation under control. If North Koreans start shooting, the Americans would expect South Koreans to shoot back, but not, not too much, not too much. Mm-hmm. And so it's more of a sort of a one for one, one to one for one reciprocity. Reciprocity, uh, as it has been the case before. Yeah. Uh, because we have to keep in mind that in the one of the patterns we have seen for decades is that if uh, North Koreans do something provocative, seriously provocative, South Koreans usually want to retaliate on a really large scale. Mm. And they are very often, have been very often prevented from such retaliation by the Americans. Is this what happened in November 2010 when uh, North Korea shelled Yonkong Island? Yeah. Did did President Im Yong-bak want to retaliate in a large scale? According to uh, to what I know, yes, and the same was about uh, President Park Jong Hee in after 68? the yes, sixty eight, yes, sixty eight, and so on. Yeah, so it has happened before. Uh, question is whether American side is now able and willing to control. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, given the general mood in the current administration and South Korean public, I would expect that uh, South Koreans will retaliate many for. Uh-huh, so no, one to ten, yes, maybe. Or yes, something. yes, yeah. Uh, three North Korean shots, ten uh, South Korean shots yeah. as a reaction. Well, now you you also wrote in your uh, uh, recent column uh, that North Korea's dual deployment of ICBMs and tactical nuclear weapons will significantly alter the strategic landscape on the Korean Peninsula. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, because as I have mentioned, the unification of the country or as a conquest of the unruly South has been a dream of the North Korean leaders for 70 years. Yeah. But, actually longer, 70, almost 80 years. But until recently, this was a dream, starting from, say, essentially from the 1960s and definitely from the late 1980s, they understood that under no conceivable scenario they would be able to conquer the South using conventional weapons. Mm. But now the situation is changing. First time since maybe the late 1940s, North Korea is getting means to achieve this goal. Two means. First, they are developing ICBMs capable of hitting the continental United States. Now, North Korea is the world's third country after Russia and China which is able to deliver a nuclear strike to the continental United States. And the recent uh, missile ICBM 
Hwasson-18 yeah. is a solid fuel missile. And this is important. Because if you have a liquid fuel missile and all the earlier ICBMs, all the long-range missiles were, used to be liquid fuel, you need some time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes hours to fuel it. And it has to be on the launch pad. Everybody can see it. But if it's in a missile silo, remember America and the Soviet Union had the liquid-fueled rockets in missile silos that were ready to go at any time, and they're always filled, weren't they? No, they are not. They, you cannot keep liquid-fueled missile fully fueled. Okay. Sometimes you can have liquid fuel inside missile, but you uh, you still need to add a uh, how it's called uh, oxidizer. I see. Otherwise, it wouldn't fly. But that can be done. Um, out of the view of, of if, if, it's it's, in if it's in silo, yeah. probably it's possible to right. do. But I strongly suspect that there are some signals and ah. it takes maybe even longer time. I see. So basically, it's a kind of vulnerability. And if you have a solid fuel missile, it can be prepared for a launch in minutes. It can be it can be easily hidden because they are using TL, uh, a transporter erector launcher. Yeah, which can move across the country, which can be quite easily hidden in many underground facilities. Uh, so it means that the new missile is much more difficult to intercept. Uh, it's much more difficult to be destroyed at the launch pad, mm. and they are going to walk in that direction sooner or later. I have no idea how much time it will take. They will develop missiles capable of penetrating American um, missile defenses. It's the first part of the story. So they hope that at some point in future, not tomorrow, not the next year, maybe not, not even the next decade, uh, at some distant on point in the future, when the United States is in trouble, when the when the Americans have somebody whom North Koreans will see as a weak president, mm -hmm. or there is some crisis of whichever. The uh, North Koreans will basically tell Americans, don't get involved into a future war in Korea, otherwise we will nuke your cities. And by that time, it will be a really credible threat. And at the same time, they are developing de tactical nuclear weapons, uh, which is a low-yield weapon, and it's a bit sort of counterintuitive. You need much more sophisticated technology uh -huh. to make your nuclear weapons less powerful. Mm. Yes, but they're there, almost there, obviously. Uh, they're developing tactical nuclear weapons, uh, which can be really used on the battlefield. Because if you use powerful nuclear devices, you basically destroy large areas. You cannot usually use it in a regular war. Yeah. Tactical nukes you can use. They're developing it. And it gives them decisive advantage over the South Korean military. South Korean military has a great deal of the conventional weapons, high quality, sophisticated, precision weapons, everything. But... These weapons are pretty much useless if the opponent has nuclear weapons and will to use it. And North Korean government, in basically Kim Jong-un himself and his sister, starting from last year, mm -hmm. uh, they have said a number of times that they are going to use tactical nuclear weapons against South Korea should need a rise. By the way, it was the first case when the North Koreans explicitly said that they uh, don't mind using nuclear weapons in Korea because mm. before that, the official line was, oh, don't worry over South Korean friends. We are not developing it against you. Right. We will never, ever use nuclear weapons in, on our um, beautiful peninsula. Mm. Um, not the case anymore. So the plan is clear. First, to neutralize, to blackmail Americans into not keeping aside from the conflict. And then use tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons to inflict massive damage on the South Korean military and take over the South. One thing, they need favorable international conditions. They need a big government in Washington or Washington very busy. They need sort of explicit 
at least semi agreement from China, many other things. I don't see it's coming right now. Mm-hmm. I don't see it's coming right now. But now they again have technical means. It's a bit like the late 1940s. In the late 1940s, North Korean government had weapons, uh, military force training, everything necessary to take over the South. Yeah. And they had to wait for a political condition. They were lobbying mm. for permission to attack from Joseph Stalin. Initially, in, uh, they were lobbying for permission to attack from Joseph Stalin. Yes, I think Kim first asked in January 1949 if he could have support to uh, invade uh, South Korea. As, as I understand earlier. Oh. Um, basically, uh, Catherine Vesas by she discovered 47 cables and letters uh, from Pyongyang to Moscow asking for such an attack. So it was a dream, and they began to talk about it even before the North Korean state was formally in a uh, As early as 1947? As far as I remember, yes. Wow, okay. It was a kind of their favorite topic. But uh, they needed political conditions. Yeah. And once they got political conditions, once in January 1950, Moscow finally changed its mind and uh, Joseph Stalin said it would be okay to attack the South. Everything was prepared in a matter of months. So this is something similar now. They will have means. It does not mean that they will use it immediately. Most likely, by the way, they will never use it. Most likely it will never happen. But Are you saying that that's because it's more likely that there will be some sort of coercive action, maybe in the form of blackmail, that we have these tactical nukes, the timing is right, we don't want to use them, but if we have to, we will, and it's better that South Korea just uh, gives us what we want. I don't think so. It, they will probably try, but when they say probably it will never be used because you need political conditions, you need material uh, conditions, okay. and they are getting there, not yet, yeah. because they have not tested their tactical nukes. It will take some time to test it, if even if test walk, uh, demonstrates that there are no problems, it will still take some time to mass produce these weapons, to deploy it. The ICBMs are getting better and better, but of course they are not fully deployable yet, and it might take another three, four, five, seven, ten years before they will be ready. But how do you, how do you technically test a, ready? How do you test a tactical nuke? Is that something you have to do above ground, or is it just like what the previous nuclear test? You can do it below you, ground. You, you don't need to do it above ground. Oh, okay. No difference. With, you just use the same underground testing uh-huh. facilities. No so this, this could be the seventh test that we've been waiting yes, for, right? It's what everybody expects. It's not clear, but it's a kind of majority, not everybody, majority view that this time yeah. they will try to test tactical nukes. And once they have tactical nukes mm-hmm. and reliable ICBM yep. tested and deployed, it would become possible technically. But what is possible technically does not mean that it's possible or desirable politically. Mm-hmm. So they will be ready, the military will be ready to go, uh, but it's a big question whether they will ever have political conditions which are favorable for an attack. As I have said, they need a weak or or kind of super busy, uh, overstressed American leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, They need Chinese who would not mind to have a real dangerous war, and you never know which way the war is going to go in China's neighborhood. And you basically need to have some political situation in South Korea. I'm not sure whether they will ever have ripe political conditions. But the very fact that very soon they are going to get military conditions ready is something we should worry about. Yesterday I was at a, the Asan plenum where uh, Taeyong Ho uh, spoke. And he said that the, the Taiwan Straits and the Taiwan sort of contingency and the the Korean Peninsula should be seen together as one regional theater um, so that they're both, of the, both of those issues are seen and discussed and escalated or de-escalated together. Do you see it that way? That, that, well, let me ask it a different way. Could action in the Taiwan Straits between China and perhaps the U.S. be the sort of cover that could provide North Korea with the political conditions to do what it wants? It's possible. It's possible. Uh, it's uh, my major worry, but I think that probability is quite l- relatively low. No. Why? Uh, because uh, if China is going to attack Taiwan, it's probably going to happen in the next few years. 
And it seems that North Koreans technically will not be ready for the next few years. Mm -hmm. And second, North Koreans, well, it's a kind of cliche, North Koreans are dependent on China. China is keeping them afloat because it serves China's own interest. But China is not in position to dictate North Koreans what to do, even on relatively small issues. And here we are talking a really big issue, a really big issue. Therefore, it's not the, that simple that, you know, China say, well, attack them. I, we need a bit of distraction. Mm -hmm. We need to overload a U.S. military. It can happen. It can work. Uh, but North Koreans will think many times, not twice, many times, to make sure that this serves their own interest above all. They don't care about China's interest at all. And uh, it's a part of East Asia, an interesting part, which is very often overlooked. East Asia, for all political forces, right and left, pro authoritarian and democratic, they have a remarkably little ideological solidarity. It's sometimes surprising. Mm. East Asian Democrats are not very eager to help one another. And then, but the East Asian communists or East Asian authoritarian dictators are equally, equally, can we say, self-centered. But uh, you, you are, um, I think you answered the question assuming that, I think from the perspective that China might ask North Korea to move first to give cover for, for mm -hmm. action in Taiwan. But I'm thinking, what if it starts the other way around? What if something happens in the Straits of Taiwan first and North Korea thinks, ah, the United States is busy, now's our, t our chance? It's possible. Not likely, but possible. Uh, but once again, in order to do so, they have to finish development and deployment of significant number of FCBMs theoretically capable of penetrating American anti-missile defenses, and they have to test and deploy tactical nuclear weapons. And probably it will take quite a few years so I don't think they will be ready by the time of a possible conflict in the Taiwan Strait. Well, then the, uh, the question can, uh, becomes, what can South Korea do to uh, avoid a situation like that or to prepare for a situation like that? Now, I'm sure you're aware that here in South Korea in the last couple of years, uh, the debate about South Korea getting its own nuclear arsenal or the redeployment of U.S. tactical nuclear assets to South Korean territory uh, has become a, a, a more discussed topic, and certainly at places like the Anand Plenum, mm -hmm. or Asan Plenum, for example, it seems to be almost the dominant voice there. You talk to a lot of people here in South Korea. Yeah. Do you see there being increasing support amongst uh, planners and policymakers for nuclear weapons, either South Korea's own or U.S. nuclear weapons returning to Korea? It's an understatement to say there is an increase in support. I would say there was an explosive growth uh -huh. in support for the idea of South Korea going nuclear. What caused that explosive uh, growth and support? Well, changes in the international environment. The Ukrainian war demonstrated that a regular classical large-scale war is possible because for the last few decades, many people, to be frank myself too, uh, have lived under assumption that classical mm. First World War, Second World War style, classical, old good, old bad wars, uh, basically obsolete. We're talking Not shooting, shooting on a battlefield, uh, trench shooting warfare, on the battlefield, artillery. You know, artillery columns marching, 10,000 people killed, yeah. 25,000 people killed. Assumption was if it happens, mm -hmm. it might probably in some underdeveloped areas. Mm -hmm. But two large scale modern regular armies fighting one another yeah. months after months. Yeah. Wow, are you joking? It's yeah. basically, it ceases to be a pro It ceases to be possible almost a century ago. No, we were wrong. Wrong. And was a reminder. Uh, second part is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. The Republican isolationism, or rather American isolationism. Yeah. Because election of Donald Trump was a big blow to the South Korean ideas of the United States. South Korea is a pro-American country. I would say it's a madly pro-American country. If you talk about the average South Korean conservative, mm -hmm. well, he or she thinks about the United States pretty much like, say, a French communist in 1950s thought about Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union, ah. a shining example of everything. <laughs> uh, so devotion is remarkable. Uh, but 
But devotion is probably even getting stronger. But belief in the American nuclear umbrella yeah. is getting weaker because of Donald Trump, because there is an understanding that Americans might change their mind. Uh, we have seen it back in the 1960s, in the years of Guam doctrine, mm. which was also a big shock for South Korea. And back then, it was the time, the early 1970s, when South Koreans at first tried to develop their own nuclear weapons. Remind us of the, the Guam doctrine, what that is. Uh, it was the idea, basically, of the American withdrawal. It was basically when the Americans were losing war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Any kind of commitment to Asia were seriously unpopular in the American public. And so it was basically decided that uh, the United States would withdraw, would withdraw, withdraw their forces from Asia generally. And South Koreans worried about possible withdrawal of the US troops from Korea, which was, by the way, discussed at the time, mm. uh, seriously discussed in Washington, D.C. Uh, so uh, they decided to develop their own nuclear weapons. It was in the 1970s. And they made some serious advancement, even then, when they were far poorer than now. Having said that, uh, so see, number one, uh, so the first Ukrainian experience in which demonstrated the war is possible, mm -hmm. war of invasion is possible, territorial acquisitions are possible yeah. in the modern world, second, American isolationism, and finally, we have a complete change in the balance of power. Why? When in 1954, formally, United States and Republic of Korea signed their mutual defense treaty, uh, back then, United States were absolutely safe from any kind of North Korean attack. For Americans, commitment was about sending their troops. Yep. That is professional military personnel. Right. And now they are going to answer a question. Should we risk San Francisco in order to protect Seoul? It's a completely new situation. Mm. And nobody knows how a future American president in, say, year 2047 will answer this question. Uh, so South Koreans increasingly worry that the answer will be no, we should not risk San Francisco. So they are talking about nuclear weapons. Talks about nuclear, South Korea nuclear weapons. It has been around forever. And Strangely enough, it's not probably widely understood, widely known outside Korea. Mm. South Korea was unusual. In, I believe that in no other non-nuclear developed democratic state, you will see such a level of support for idea of going nuclear. Mm -hmm. uh, for at least two decades, countless public opinion polls indicate that support for a possible South Korean nuclear program among the general population is somewhere between 55 and 75 percent. That's very high. Very high. Uh, now it's about 70 according to the recent polls. Uh, so common people have always wanted to go nuclear, but with very few exceptions, yes, there were smart, respected, even I would say even beloved, outspoken people in the South Korean political elite who were in favor of going nuclear. Uh, but they were seen as interesting eccentrics, mm. outliers, not anymore. Everything has changed about in, say, in the last year or so. So now the idea is seriously discussed. And uh, it's there, you basically did what many people do. You bracketed together the idea of South Korea's own nuclear uh, force, um, uh, own nuclear deterrent, yeah. and idea of returning American tactical nuclear weapons. But it's basically very different solutions. Why? Because, first of all, uh, there are some technical difficulties with American tactical nuclear weapons. But even forgetting about it, assuming that Americans can do it, what will it change? Frankly, nothing. Re redeployment of the American nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula will, change, will not change anything but mood of the South Korean population. Mm. Uh, because the question is whether... Americans are willing to use nuclear weapons to protect South Korea or not. If they are willing, it's completely irrelevant where these weapons are located in Busan or Kunsan 
or they have to be large, say, from size some submarine. Mm-hmm. And we know that American submarines are essentially round the clock on patrol mm-hmm. near the Korean waters. Uh, or it will be just, you know, uh, they will have to use, say, strategic bombers, who, which will t- it will take few hours mm-hmm. for them to fly from the nearest base. So the actual difference is zero. Having American tactical nuclear weapons, if it's going to happen, frankly, I'm not sure, it will probably have kind of psycho, it's a kind of psychological therapy. It's a, yeah. it's a therapy. It's a kind of, you know, symbolism. Mm. Uh, but in real balance, it changes nothing. South Korean nuclear deterrent will allow North Korea, sorry, will allow South Korea to act on its own without asking explicit permission from the Americans. So if attacked, if they face a serious attack, they can use nuclear weapons to attack the uh, North Korean formations, to attack the North Korean troops, and essentially annihilate them in a matter of seconds. Uh, So, yeah, and they are not going to ask Washington to do it, and Washington now they are not sure whether Washington will do it if necessary. But you know, so, uh, let, let's assume that South Korea does get its own nuclear weapons for a moment. Yeah. South Korea is still in an alliance relationship with the United States. Mm-hmm. So while you're probably right that technically South Korea won't have to ask Washington for permission to use nuclear weapons, I imagine that people in America might say, well, South Korea does, it, it no longer needs to have an alliance. It has its own nuclear weapons. Let's uh, finish this, and, and that way... Uh, you know, we are no longer in any danger of, uh, of of losing San Francisco, Seattle, or even Washington if North Korea retaliates against us just because South Korea uses its own nuclear weapons. So that's, it could be an end of the alliance, couldn't it? Yes, it could. But my personal impression when I talked to the United, in the United States, I was a bit surprised when I saw this kind of hints of voices starting from, say, last year in Washington, D.C., that uh, people don't really mind. You mean the Americans don't mind the idea of South Korea having its own nuclear arsenal? Yeah. They're not going to openly encourage it. Mm -hmm. And this is a question. In order to have nuclear weapons, uh, South Korean government, South Korean conservatives will have to sort of challenge the official American position because right now they hope to persuade Americans to give them explicit permission to go nuclear. Not going to happen. Mm. Uh, sig- because South Korea is a signatory of the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, yes, and they want to formally withdraw from the treaty, ask permission, everything. It's not going to happen. There is that clause in the treaty that allows any nation months, to yeah. withdraw it if it feels that its supreme yes. interests uh, or sovereignty are threatened. Yes. Our uh, question is uh, that there will be some sanctions. And uh, South Korean decision makers, especially on the right, they are so afraid of getting in trouble with the United States that they want an explicit prior permission, something they are not going to get. So Americans will not be openly supporting it. But going back to your initial question, Mm. I believe that after some ritual statements are made, some ritual performance, well, is done, like, say, some minor uh, sanctions yeah. on South Korea, Americans will grudgingly accept it. Because in the end of the day, it will relieve them from some risks and responsibilities. Mm. But it's really a big unknown and opponents of, going, of uh, the nuclear option inside South Korea, they usually, of, they usually cite the alliance as a major reason why South Korea should never go new. It's what you said. It's said by people who, who insist that uh, South Korea should not try to develop its own nuclear weapon. What's your position? What do you think? Is it a good idea for South Korea to get nuclear weapons of its own? Uh, I believe that from the South Korean national, in point of South Korean national interest, in the current world, which is getting hectic, unruly, unreliable, and far more risky than anybody expected just 10 years ago, mm-hmm. in this world... Your only guarantee of your security is your nuclear deterrent force, period. So you can see, the, the, you can understand the South Korean, uh, those in South Korea who argue for a nuclear arsenal. I'm, I, I fully support it. I believe that this is the only reliable long-term solution, not only for South Korea, for any country which is facing even relatively remote threat.
It sounds like you're really sort of against the idea of nuclear non-proliferation now in this hectic, chaotic, <sighs> dangerous world. Is it's this a new a position for you? A new, new. I just uh, basically, if you like, I follow the mainstream in this ca- ca- uh-huh. regard. I changed my position in the year, over last year gradually because for decades I did not take the, even this talk seriously. But having said that, it's a, a sort of sad paradox. If you look at the situation from the general point of view of human humankind, mm. proliferation is bad. Yeah. Uh, because if we have proliferation, sooner or later we'll get some nuclear conflict. Right. Or an accident. Uh, yeah, any kind of nuclear use, and it will cost a lot of lives. Lot of lives. And it will be really, it's, it's not something to be happy about. Right. And in more extreme case, uh, it increases the risks of a total self-destruction of humankind. So it's bad. However, mm. it's a usual contradiction between group interest and yep. individual interest. Right. Yes, as a group, humankind will lose, will <laughs> lose if every state which faces any kind of real or imaginary danger developing nuclear weapons. But every single state, uh-huh. every single state will get a lot. So as a group, we will lose. As a st- every single state, including South Korean state, will get a lot. And you can ask a question, why should Koreans sacrifice everything, including their lives, for some possible you know, happiness of humankind mm-hmm. to make sure that some crazy dictator in Africa will not use nuclear weapons 35 years later? Big question. Personally, I don't see why, how you can persuade South Koreans to make such a sacrifice. Personally, I'm not inclined to do such a sacrifice. If world cares about its future, it should create, should guarantee security of smaller non-nuclear state. But the current, in the current situation, mm-hmm. it's increasingly clear that the world is moving in a direction where such security cannot be guaranteed. And it means everybody who faces any threat should go nuclear. And there are maybe 50, 70 states worldwide which have reasons to go nuclear and means to go nuclear. And it's not good, but it's where the world is going. It sounds like you accept the idea that South Korea going nuclear is not the end of a process, but rather the beginning of a process. I mean, Japan might want to go nuclear. Taiwan might want to go nuclear. Vietnam. Don't forget about Vietnam. I'm not forgetting about Vietnam. Yes, and Myanmar. Yes, I mean... uh, yeah, gosh, um, that's that's grim news. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about um, the uh, the Ukraine war. What's happening? Well, how is that impact on Korea? You've already mentioned one impact, and that is that uh, for South Korea, it shows that you know uh, conventional warfare is still possible, and having your own nuclear weapons is uh, is the best defense. Uh, but we also have other situations there that um, uh, President Putin of Russia has said that if if South Korea helps Ukraine, he might help North Korea militarily again. Is that a bluff? Do you see that as a realistic threat? Mm, was it Putin? I believe Medvedev. But anyway, I maybe I'm not phrasing well. One of the two. Uh, well enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yes, I believe. But I don't think it's going to change much. Okay. Because uh, Russia, yes, it will provide North Korea with some technology. But I don't see Russia providing North Korea with nuclear or missile technology. And this is the only type of military technology, well, not only the major types, North Koreans need. Of course, if it happens, uh, uh, well, it's highly likely Russians, Russians will do it. And it will be, of course, a violation of the UN Security Council mm. resolutions. Uh, but the UN Security Council uh, essentially is politically dead. And it's probably for a long time. We are now in a situation when this is a kind of pretty useless body. But I don't think it will change much. Going back to South Korean situation, problem is South Koreans don't really want to assist Ukraine directly. Why? I mentioned some peculiar feature of South Korea and generally speaking, most East Asian countries. They are very, I would say, parochial, Mm -hmm. self-centered. There is a remarkably low level of solidarity and interest in international activities of any kind. uh, South Korea has always followed a simple reason. They were willing to trade and engage with every single country of the world. They did not care 
about the, this country's domestic political system. If this country is willing to buy South Korean, say, LCD TVs mm -hmm. or fridges, fine. Uh, if this uh, country ruler has a habit of eating infants every morning, it's not our business. So it was a traditional way of non-involvement with, poli with a political and ideological confrontation worldwide. And it's not only uh, South Korea. Mm. If you well, look China at has a similar... China has the same approach. It's basically all East Asian countries. It's interesting enough, for example, if you look at East Asia, you have three democ democracies here, mm -hmm. uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Yeah. But if you look at the uh, relations, you see, you might be surprised how insignificant, how little significance is attached to the supposed ideological solidarity. You see, in, say, in Europe or in other parts of the world, very often you have the idea that we, being good Democrats, should help Democrats otherwise. Yeah. At least uh, the political system, similar political and ideological system of a neighboring country usually makes you a bit more sympathetic. Uh, you sort of prefer it over a different country nearby. But it's not here, it's not here, it's not in East Asia. If you look at what, uh, say, South Koreans say and think about democratic Japan, democratic Taiwan, authoritarian Vietnam, authoritarian China, you will not see much difference. Uh, do you see a, I mean, we've talked here on the NK News podcast a few times about uh, the prospect of North Korea sending some kind of military assistance or soldiers or uh, construction crews to uh, eastern Ukraine to yes. help Russia. Have you, uh, do you what do you see there? Oh, I'm not. I'm not there. I don't know. Talking about construction workers too early, I think it's still going to happen. There are persistent reports about ammunition being delivered. Mm. Talking about more, uh, uh, you know, talks about troops. I've never took it seriously. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen. But going back to this idea of, you know, uh, uh, selling arms to Ukraine, South Korean government is now doing it because they, as I have said. In the current situation, they want to strengthen their alliance with the United States. Yeah. They know that this is what Americans want. And if Washington is pushing uh, so hard enough, it will really start selling weapons to Ukraine. But for the time being, I see that this essentially very imprecise statement by President Yoon mm -hmm. was just a way to send right signals to Washington. Look, we are probably mm -hmm. sometime will consider helping you in this uh, in this regard as well, so just well, give us something. Right. Uh, so it was more kind of uh, propaganda, if you like, mm -hmm. smoke screen yeah. before the summit. Some virtue signal. Uh, now, Andre, you talk to people in government and academia, not just in South Korea, but also in the United States and in China, don't you? Not recently in China. China ah. is completely closed for three years, and my connections with Chinese are essentially frozen. Ah. It's very difficult to contact them, partially because the country is getting far more repressive now, so people are simply afraid mm. to talk. But major reason is just physically you cannot go to China. Mm -hmm. It's getting easier now, but maybe I will go there later this year. I hope so, but... No, not China. United okay. States, yes. Europe, what, yes. What What's your assessment of the mood in, in these countries where you're talking to people? Do they uh, see it as, as dangerous as you do? Yes, probably even more. Uh, many, people really, many people feel uneasy, say even in Washington. Of course, they are happy to have... <laughs> Uh, ma, ma, yes, I will. I know many people will, will not agree with me. I would say a mildly pro-American administration of Moon Jae-in mm -hmm. being replaced by madly pro-American administration of Yoon suk uh, So South Korea is a pro-American. South Korean left, which a long time ago used to harbor some anti-American feelings, have changed a lot, largely because they distrust China. Seriously, distrust chain. I'm yeah. talking about the left in South Korea. Yeah, that, that's the development after the uh, after the big anti-beef protests of 2008. Yes, yes, it's a national history now. But of course, Yoon suk yeol is far more pro-American. Uh, but still, people in Washington who are quite happy about having this new government still feel uncomfortable about uh, this excessively 
hawkish stance of Yun Sokyeol. There are fears that in case of some confrontation on the DMZ, the South Koreans will overreact. And personally, I do share these fears. It's sort of, not if not universal, but much widespread among the U.S. policy makers and analysts. What kind of action are we talking about here? Uh, you know... Mm, North Koreans have any provocation, like uh -huh. Yonpyeondo Island shelling in 2010, and South Koreans retaliate in, as you, we have said, many fold, mm. out of proportion. And it provokes some kind of North Koreans counter-counter strike, and we have a crisis in Korea. It's not what people in Washington want, and they worry that a sort of bellicosity mm. of the current administration might result in such a crisis. Now, you're still here in Korea. Yeah. Uh, you haven't left yet. Are you uh, more optimistic or, or pessimistic? Mm, I'm not going to leave anyway. It's my family question. Uh -huh. I think we should not worry for the next few years uh, because an exchange of fire is likely to be localized. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can, be unhappy, uh, you can be very unlucky, but you know, you can be very unlucky crossing a street in any part of the well. world. I think that probability is not that much different. But in the long run, in the long run, if we are talking not next few years, but next couple of decades, mm -hmm. or a bit longer, the next few decades, Korea Peninsula is again getting seriously dangerous. Because for a long time, pretty much since I began to do North Korean studies in the mid-1980s, I have repeated many times that all these talks about dangers are exaggerated. That North Korean government is a very unpleasant government, but people who are under threat because of, because of, you know, the Kim family regime are almost exclusively North Korean common people. Mm. Everybody else should not worry too much about North Korea because they are maybe unwilling and definitely unable to create serious trouble. And it's changing now they are increasingly able mm -hmm. to create serious trouble and probably willing to do willing so. To, yeah. Okay, well, that's probably a good place to, uh, to finish for today. Uh, so, in short, the next few years, it's reasonably safe to continue living in South Korea. In uh, spite, sorry for interrupting you, in spite of a relatively high possibility of one of few localized exchanges of fire with right. dozens, maybe even hundreds of people killed. Okay, wow. Good but it's not a war. It's not a war. Not a war, okay, it, because it won't escalate beyond that. Okay. No. Well, let's, uh, let's hope, fingers crossed, that it doesn't come to that, but we will uh, we'll see, and we'll definitely have you on the show again, Andre, to talk about that. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Andre Lanko, for coming on the NK News podcast. Don't forget, listeners, you can read Andre's regular columns only by subscribing to nknews.org, so don't delay. Subscribe today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you already have an NK News account, and if you're a think tank, business, or academic institution, check out NK Pro. Our NK Pro platform offers unparalleled services specifically catering to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. You can inquire about access or a free trial membership by writing an email to membership at nknews.org today. Our thanks, as always, go to Brian Betts and Darius Dare for facilitating this episode and to our post-recording producer genius Gabby Magnuson, who cuts out all the extraneous noises, awkward silences, bodily functions, etc. Thank you very much for listening again next time. <laughs>